we will now begin examining the peripheral nervous system. That's the part of the nervous system that's arising from the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system, but then goes outward to the muscles of the body and brings sensation from the skin and sensory organs of the body back to the spinal cord and thereafter to the higher areas like the brain and brainstem. So notice that the spinal cord is giving off multiple rootlets that are coming off of and going into the spinal cord. Now there are both anterior and posterior rootlets that are going to contribute to a spinal nerve which will then give off what are known as anterior and posterior rami that are traveling to the peripheral structures. We'll see more of those in just a moment. What I want you to note now is that the spinal cord itself is surrounded by the vertebra and the vertebra have been shown having been removed here and now we can see that below the vertebra we have a layer of fat and a venous plexus. So we have fat and venous plexus here, and it's going to be supporting the spinal cord, but before we get to it, we have our dense dura mater, shown here in gray, and then a more flimsy arachnoid mater, shown here in white. And only then do we come to the actual spinal cord and nerve roots. The spinal cord has swellings in it in the cervical and lumbar areas because of the number of nerves that are coming and going from the upper and lower limbs. So as we travel more inferiorly, we're going to find that, interestingly, the spinal cord does not extend all the way to the sacrum. Instead, the spinal cord stops approximately at the L1 and L2 level. So if we have the spinal cord stopping there, how on earth do we get innervation all the way down to the sacral and coccygeal uh, levels? The reason is that the spinal cord has given off these roots that are higher up but it gives off all those roots for the sacral and coccygeal levels before it ceases to exist. And so we have all those roots exiting at the appropriate area between adjacent vertebrae. So our S1 nerve may be arising here, but it came from a portion of the spinal cord that was up at this level. So just remember that the spinal cord is shorter than the entire vertebral column, and because of that, the roots inferiorly have become stretched out as they reach that area. And the name for those roots all bundled together is the cauda equina, or horse's tail. There is a tiny little continuation of the tip of the cord called the conus medullaris that gives off a f just a very fine little thread called the felum terminale that anchors it to the sacrum so that the spinal cord remains tucked in place. Now here, we're going to take a quick look at the cord inside of the vertebra. So here, we can see that we have the vertebra, the fat uh, surrounding the spinal cord. In gray, we have the dura mater. White, we have the arachnoid mater. And then finally, we get to the spinal cord itself. Now the spinal cord has white matter on the outside and gray matter, or nerve cell bodies, on the inside. So that's a difference between it and the brain. Gray matter is internal, white matter is external. And I want you to note that the vertebra itself is shown here, and the vertebral body is giving us a good view of the intervertebral disc with the nucleus pulposus in the middle and the annulus fibrosus surrounding and maintaining it in place. Now the spinal cord in this area is going to have areas that are specialized for motor and sensory activity, and that's going to correspond to the nerve roots, anterior and posterior roots that it gives off to make the spinal nerve. We can now see a zoomed in view of the spinal cord sitting within the spinal canal of the vertebra. We can see that the vertebral body is here, spinous processes here, extra credit if you noted the bifid processes and uncinate processes here, so we're in a cervical level of the vertebra. We can see the fat surrounding the spinal cord within the canal. We've got some venous plexi in there as well. Then the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and finally the cord itself covered by a layer of pia mater. What I want you to focus on right now is the gray matter of the cord itself. So the gray matter has functional differences depending on where we're at. This posterior or dorsal horn of the spinal cord contains sensory nerve cells along with some interneurons that go between other nerve cells. And this anterior or ventral area contains motor nerve cells. Now these motor nerve cells are going to give off an axon. Now axons are an extension of a nerve cell, and what they're going to do is travel 
So motor nerves give off an axon that travels through these anterior roots. So anterior roots are motor and they're traveling further laterally through the intervertebral foramen between two adjacent vertebra to get to what's called the spinal nerve. Information from the periphery or from organs is coming into the spinal cord from these branches and as it does so it's going to travel into this posterior root to reach the posterior horn of the spinal cord. But you should note along the way there's a cluster of cell bodies that reside in what are known as posterior root ganglia or dorsal root ganglia. So these sensory nerve cell bodies are located here with an axon coming to them from the outside and another portion of that axon traveling medially to the posterior horn of the spinal cord. So let's zoom out here now to the spinal nerve itself. So the spinal nerve contains sensory information coming in, motor information coming out, so it's mixed posterior root with sensory only, anterior root, motor only, but here the spinal nerve is mixed and it's going to split into what's known as a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus. And these rami are going to be sensory and motor. So rami, anterior rami go to the body wall and limbs, whereas posterior rami go to the back, so the intrinsic muscles and the skin of the back. So Looking at all of that and trying to figure out how it works can be a little daunting, so what we're going to do next is draw out a simplified schematic of this area to explain how the spinal nerve works. We'll now take a look at a much simplified schematic of the spinal cord giving rise to the spinal nerve and its branches. So as before, we have our posterior or dorsal horn here and our anterior or ventral horn here. So the posterior horn contains sensory nerve cells along with some interneurons. Anterior horn contains motor neurons. And then here we're going to start with motor, so we'll just kind of scribble in in red here. That red equals motor. So we'll start by drawing in some motor neurons. Now I'm drawing these in much much bigger than they actually are in real life, but for clarity we have our neuron cell bodies in the anterior horn they're going to give off an axon, which is an extension of that cell that conveys information. It's going to travel through this motor root. The anterior root is motor, so we'll just kind of draw that in there as well. And from the anterior root, it's going to join the other branches that are coming in at the spinal nerve. So the spinal nerve is here where we have a convergence of these roots. And from there, a motor axon could choose to go to the posterior ramus, which is going to go to the intrinsic muscles of the back, or to an anterior ramus, which would go to muscles of the torso or the limbs. So once again, posterior ramus or anterior ramus. So that's motor. We'll now draw in sensory, and sensory we're going to choose to make purple. So purple for sensory. Now sensory information is not starting in the cord, it actually is going to be coming from the periphery. So let's say we've got some input from a limb or the torso, it's going to be coming from this anterior root. So this axon will be traveling through the anterior ramus, pardon me, anterior ramus to reach the spinal nerve. And if that information were coming from the back, it would be traveling through a posterior ramus to get there. So we'd have two separate axons coming in. For simplicity's sake, we'll just draw one from here on out. And that axon, instead of going to an anterior root, is going to go into the sensory branch here, and that's going to be the posterior root. So it's going to travel down this posterior root, but in this bulge, something interesting is happening. That's where the sensory nerve cell body is located. And this is called a posterior root ganglion or dorsal root ganglion is also commonly used to describe it and that's going to be where the nerve cell bodies are but unlike a lot of other places in the body no synapse happens here this axon comes in and then just keeps on going a branch of it follows the rest of the way into this posterior root to get to the posterior horn and 
There's a variety of things it can do from there. It can travel upwards, it can synapse. We're just going to show it synapsing with a secondary sensory cell body here in the posterior horn. And that can, again, travel to the other side, travel to the same side, go up, but essentially it can do a variety of things there. One thing it can do is actually signal some interneurons to cause changes in that same level. So either directly or more likely indirectly we can have interneurons that then synapse with these motor cells to perhaps cause a reflex where we have sudden sensory input that causes a muscle reflex or a muscle withdrawal. Returning to the back, we can't really see the distinction between the anterior and posterior rami here except that this model is showing individual posterior rami moving out at each level. Now the posterior rami stay separate from each other more or less and travel to the intrinsic muscles of the back like the transversus spinalis, the erector spinae and they're going to innervate those muscles along with the overlying skin. The anterior rami on the other hand tend to form plexi that go to the body trunk, the limb muscles, as well as the skin of that area. One thing I want to note though is that the segmental nature of each of these spinal nerves is maintained in strips of skin that go down the back and the torso and even into the limbs that are called dermatomes. And dermatomes are simply the area that has sensory innervation from a specific spinal nerve and as we travel further down the cord, those dermatomes follow suit as well. drawn in there as well. Next up we have sensory. We're going to draw that in purple. So sensory we here in purple. We're going to take a break. All these guys saw down a tree or some damn thing.